Okay, so we're given an expression for f of x, saying f of x equals 2x squared plus 4x plus 9. And part A says we need to write f of x in the form of a multiplied by x plus b all squared plus c, where a, b, and c are integers to be found. And this is a three mark question. So now essentially what this question is asking us to do is complete the square. Because when we complete the square, um, f of x will be written um, in this form. So we're going to do that now. So we're going to start off saying f of x equals 2x squared plus 4x plus 9. And we've got a slight issue here because we've got a coefficient of x squared, uh, which isn't 1. So here we've got 2x squared. Uh, this isn't too much of an issue because what we could do is we just factorise out the 2. So we're just left with a single x squared. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring the 2 out the front of the brackets. So we're left with x squared plus 2x. Now what I could do is divide the 9 by 2 as well and bring that into the bracket. However, because it's an odd number, that wouldn't work out very well. So actually, I'm just going to close the bracket here and leave the 9 on the outside, which works absolutely fine. So now we've done this, we can just complete the square on what's inside the bracket here. So doing that, I'm going to put a square bracket here so we can easily see this. And we're left with x. And then we need to divide the coefficient of x by 2. So dividing 2 by 2, we just get 1. You square that. And then we take away this number squared. So it's 1 squared. However, 1 squared is just 1. So we're just going to write 1 here. Brilliant. Now I'm going to close the square bracket off and just keep the 9 here on the end. Now what I'm going to do is multiply the 2 back through into the bracket. So we've got 2x plus 1 all squared minus 2 plus 9. And then the last thing I'm going to do is I'm just going to tidy up. We've still got the 2 x plus 1 squared and we're left with a plus 7 on the end. Right, so looking to see where we get the 3 marks. We get 1 mark here and you correctly identified uh, that a would be 2. Uh, we then get a second mark here because then we've correctly identified that b would be 1. And then we get the final mark down here um, where we've correctly identified that c would be 7. Great, so now for part b, we need to sketch the curve with the equation y equals f of x, showing any points of intersection with the coordinate axes and the coordinates of any turning points. And again, this is three marks. Okay, so y equals f of x. So I'm going to write it out as an equation of y. So we've got y equals, and we completed the square in the previous part. Um, and because they sort of follow and link to each other, I'm going to write it out in the completed the square form, because um, I think this would be helpful. I'm just going to have a think about what sort of shape the graph could be. So we know f of x is a quadratic and it's got a positive coefficient of x squared. So we know that the graph is going to look something like this, something like a smiley face. However, to sketch this, we need to find out any points of intersection and the coordinates of the turning points. Well, let's think about points of intersection first. So you've got the y-intercept when x equals 0. So we're going to try that. We would say y equals 2. And if we set x equal to 0, we've got 0 plus 1 squared plus 7, which equals, okay, so that's 2. And this bracket would just turn out to be 1. So we can ignore that. And that would be 7 plus 2. And that would be 9. So therefore, the y-intercept is going to be at 0, 9. So I'm going to think about the x-intercept. So the x-intercept is when y equals 0. So if we say 0, so we set y equal to 0, so 0 equals 2, x plus 1 squared plus 7. Okay, so if we uh, take away 7 from both sides, we've got that 2x plus 1 squared equals minus 7. So then x plus 1 squared, dividing both sides by 2, is minus 7 over 2. Ah, we've run into a slight issue here because we've got a negative this side. However, to solve for x, we're going to need to square root both sides. And we can't square root a negative number. Therefore, we can't solve this. And so the curve doesn't intersect the x-axis. Or you could also say uh, that it has no real roots. Okay, brilliant. So we've worked that out. The last thing we need to sort out is if there are any turning points. And this is great because there's a little trick we can use um, in a form once we've completed the square. So when we've got something um, that's in the form y equals 
x minus a squared plus b. So this is the form you get when you complete the square. The turning point is a, b. Well, that's great because our curve is actually in that form, so we can easily work that out. So we've got y equals and 2 x and now we've got x plus 1 but I'm going to write it as minus minus 1 because um, that just makes it easier to visualize squared plus 7. Okay so look at that we can see that the turning point will be at minus 1 7. So now using this information we're going to actually sketch the curve on this set of axes here. So the first thing we know is the y intercept and that's at 0 9. Um, so that's roughly here and it's just a sketch so we don't need to be too accurate as long as we label our points and we know it doesn't cross the x-axis because there are no real roots we don't need to worry about that and look at the turning point okay that's at minus one seven so you know that's in this quadrant here and I'll say that's about here so minus one seven I'm going to carefully draw a u-shaped curve going through those points Fantastic. So now looking to where we get the three marks, we get all the marks um, from on the graph. Um, so we get one mark here uh, for having the correct y intercept, so 0, 9. Uh, we get the second mark for the correct turning point, so minus 1, 7. And then we get a third mark uh, for it correctly being a U-shaped curve. Okay, so we're going to have a look at part C now. So part C1 just says, describe fully the transformation that maps the curve with equation y equals f of x onto the curve with the equation y equals g of x, where g of x equals 2, multiplied by x minus 2 all squared, plus 4x minus 3. And down here I've also written our answers to part a and part b, which we worked out a second ago, just in case you want to refer back to them. Right, so the first thing we're going to do is have a look, because we've written out f of x in a couple of different ways. So we've written it out like this, uh, but it's also written out like this, originally in the question. Um, and we're going to have a look at g of x to see which one would be best to work with. Um, so look at g of x in the question. We see here it's 2 multiplied by x minus 2 all squared plus 4x minus 3. And we can see here we've got 4x. And here in this form of f of x, we've also got 4x. So I think this one will be the easiest one to work with. So that's what I'm going to do. Let's write down f of x here. And g of x. We need to try and work out a transformation that gets us from f of x to g of x. Now this is quite good because they're in a similar form. We've got 2 multiplied by something squared. 2 multiplied by something squared. We've got 4x, 4x. And then we've got a constant and a constant. The difference here is we've got an x here and x minus 2 here. So the first thing I'm going to try is actually we've got x going to x minus 2. So if I try f of x minus 2, we're going to see what we get. So f of x minus 2, we get 2 x minus 2 squared plus 4x minus 2 plus 9 and that equals 2 x minus 2 squared and I'm going to leave it like this and not expand it because that's actually what we want in g of x and I'm going to try expanding this bracket so we're going to have plus 4x minus 8 plus 9 and if we just tidy it up at the end we've got 2 x minus 2 squared plus 4x plus 1. Okay, so that's looking good actually because um, if we compare our f of x minus 2 to g of x, well, we've got the same term here. They've both got 4x. The only difference is a constant. The difference between this and this is 4. So what I'm now going to try is f of x minus 2 minus 4. So we're going to see what we get when we do that. So we get 2 x minus 2 squared plus 4x minus 2, plus 9 minus 4. So we've got 2x minus 2 squared, plus 4x minus 8, plus 9 minus 4. And that equals 2 multiplied by x minus 2 squared, plus 4x. And if we tidy this all up here, we get minus 3. I know that's great, because actually, this matches up exactly um, to what g of x equals. That means, so writing this out a bit clearer, g of x is actually equivalent to f of x minus 2 minus 4. So that's perfect. Now we just need to try and work out what transformation this represents. Now I'm going to think of some transformations in general. In general, 
if we have f of x minus a, that is a translation by vector a0, or if we've got a transformation which is f of x, say plus b, that's a translation by vector 0b. Using that, we could essentially say that this 2 is our a term, and this minus 4 is our b term. So therefore, the transformation that maps y equals f of x onto y equals g of x is a translation by vector 2 minus 4. Right, so we're going to take a look at the final part, part c, part 2. And we need to find the range of this function h of x, where h of x is defined as being 21 over 2x squared plus 4x plus 9. I've also copied in our answer to part b here, because that might be useful in a minute. So the first thing to notice is that if we write out h of x like this, the denominator of h of x is actually f of x. So we can rewrite this out actually as h of x equals 21 over f of x. Okay, and that's really useful because we've actually got a sketch of the curve of f of x right here. So we sort of look at that to see what the behavior would be. Now the first thing I'm going to think about is as f of x tend towards plus or minus infinity, we're going to see what happens. So as it tends towards plus or minus infinity, you see it just keeps going, getting bigger and bigger and bigger, and it just won't stop, it'll just keep going, getting bigger and bigger, both in the positive and the negative direction. Ah, and this is good, because f of x on the denominator, and so if it's f of x tends towards infinity, because um, it's on the denominator, if you divide by a big number, you get a really small number. So this means that as f of x tends towards infinity, h of x tends towards zero. Because f of x get bigger and bigger and bigger, you're defining by a bigger and bigger number each time, which means h of x is getting closer and closer to zero. Okay, so we can start to write down our range of h of x here. So we know that it could go down to zero. Now it can never get to zero, so it's only less than, it's not less than or equal to. So the lower bound of our range is zero. Now I want to think about what the maximum value is, so what the upper bound of the range of h of x could be. Now, well, we get the largest value when we divide by the smallest value. So when f of x is minimum, that's when we're going to get the largest value of h of x. Actually, that's perfect because right here, this is the minimum point of f of x. So down here I can write, so we've got the maximum h of x when f of x is at its minimum. We see when it's its minimum, We've got a 7 here. So what I'm going to do is do 21 divided by 7, which equals 3. Okay, great. So the maximum that h of x could be is 3. And it could equal 3, so we're going to write it like this. And now this is the answer. So we finish the question. This is the range of h of x. So looking to see where we get our four marks in question C. We get two marks um, for the correct uh, vector. So saying that it's a translation by this vector. Um, if we'd only got um, one of these values correct, then we'd only get one mark. And here we get one mark um, for this. So working out that um, we'll get the maximum value of h of x when we've got the minimum value of f of x. And the minimum value of f of x is 7. Um, so working out uh, 21 divided by 7 equaling 3. And then we get the final mark for the correct range of h of x.